Hello, everyone. Um, I'm back again, and I hope this works this time. Let me just check on my phone. It seems to be broadcasting correctly now. So the next step is to share my screen with you. Okay, I've just got someone saying they can't find this on the 11 plus journey. So I'm just going to tap out a message to the person who cannot find this. Um, Yeah. Okay. I seem to be live. I seem to be live. I can see myself uh, on my phone. That's good. Right. Uh, I'm going to share my screen with you now. And hopefully the this, I hope I should speak grammatically correctly. I hope the screen share will work this time. Not create infinite copies of itself. Well, because it's open. And I'm sharing my I'm sharing my tab with you, that's why. Okay, um if anyone is there, can you just tap in the chat and let me know whether you can see me, please? Or whether you can see my screen. Hmm. Okay. Okay. So I think what you're you're not seeing what you should be seeing. So let me close that. And let me reshare. Okay, okay. So I know it happened. I won't explain what I think happened, but yes, we are there now. We are there. So you can now see my screen. Uh, well, you can see the bit of the screen that I want you to see. Um, so welcome, everyone. It's nice to have you here. And sorry about the delay getting started. Um, technical hiccups. Um, okay. I was... An hour before this lesson at two o'clock, I was lying on my bed. My kids are out, so the house was really peaceful. I was reading Bambi. And um, I was I was beginning to be, feel a bit sleepy. And I was dozing off. And I was thinking, mm, should I doze off? Because I've got to I've got to teach in in an hour. And I thought it wouldn't look good if I missed this, if, if the teacher falls asleep and doesn't turn up to the lesson. Um, but I was so tempted to have a little nap and yeah, and I could have done actually, I could have had a nap because five minutes ago, the Amazon man rang my doorbell, uh, and my doorbell was very loud. So I would have woken up anyway. Anyway, that's nothing to do with anything. Um, we have a lesson today on creative writing. Um, so it's nice to have you here. Oh, got quite a few people. Um, so hello, quite a few people, kids. I assume you're all kids, maybe parents do. Hi, kids and parents. We're going to do a lesson on creative writing today, but I'll go through the introductions first of all. So my name is James. I'm a tutor at 11 Plus Prep School. You can see our logo and name, web address and WhatsApp phone number on the screen. So uh, 11 Plus Prep School, the small group tuition, um, our website is 11plusprepschool.co.uk, and if you want to get in touch with me, uh, you can call me or WhatsApp me on 07736252419. And because it is the summer holiday soon, we have summer boot camps, which you might be interested in. If your parents are there, give them a shout and say, James has got some summer boot camps 
going and I, I want to attend them because you do you really do um okay so the summer boot camps um they're kind of intensive lessons in maths verbal and nonverbal reasoning and english um but no creative writing which is what we're doing today but nonetheless if you want maths nonverbal verbal reasoning or english you can join up you can sign up to our um, boot camps and we will we will make sure you know what you need to know for your exams the next bit of introduction is to thank the 11 plus journey for hosting this event um so you're all here so you know the the 11 plus journey but just to say the 11 plus journey is a community of parents and educators involved in the overall development of children through academic excellence and you can visit their website the 11 plus journey.co.uk for more resources this video lesson will also be available on the 11 plus journey youtube channel at some point after this lesson um and it's been uploaded to the relevant media right let's get on with today's lesson sort of so i'm very very glad that i didn't promote this lesson as descriptive writing based on a visual prompt i just promoted it as descriptive writing i'm very lucky that i did because excuse me i had a biscuit before i started and, and it's making itself known um very lucky that I didn't call it descriptive writing based on a visual prompt because the photograph that I use for this lesson, and I always check it, 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 it was Creative Commons, and I always check before I do a lesson to make sure that um, Creative Commons stuff that I've been using is still Creative Commons. So I went to the Creative Commons library and I couldn't find this this picture. It's a photograph anywhere. It's a lovely, lovely artistic photograph of. Um, it was uh, a young woman um, in a maybe a burgundy dress. I can't remember the color now. And she's kind of got strawberry blonde hair, sitting on a beach, resting up against a rowing boat. It, it's it's very artistic, so it, it's kind of like a somber picture. It's like not like a happy beach scene. Um, it, it it's quite a solitary, somber picture of this this girl, kind of front and center of the picture resting against a rowing boat um you can see you know in the background a bit of cliff and to the side of her uh, a bit of shingle and a bit of sea and i was going to use that picture and i checked the creative commons library and it wasn't there anymore so i thought i'd err on the side of caution and not use it it's a lovely picture which um has given me um Cause to, to change my approach to this lesson somewhat. So instead of using a picture prompt, we're going to use a text prompt. And the text prompt is this. It's pretty much the same thing. It describes what, you know, partly what the picture um, depicted. So imagine that you are on a beach resting against the side of a rowing boat. Very contrived, but go with me on this. Describe what you experience. So who knows, kids out there, or maybe parents, who knows what descriptive writing is? Who can tell me? Looking at your comments now on my phone, that's my head bowing down. Anyone tell me what they think descriptive writing is or what it is not? No one. No one's going to speak. Probably because none of my students are, are here today. They're very, they're very loud. Um, they speak up for themselves um, because they're very familiar with me. But yes, please do speak out. I don't bite. Um, okay. So yes, someone says when you describe something. That that that's right. So a description is a description, meaning it's not a narrative piece. So if you are in an exam. Um, two very common ways of testing your creative writing is one, getting you to write a story, two, getting you to write a descriptive piece. And the essential difference between a story and a descriptive piece is that a story has a narrative 
and a descriptive piece doesn't. So a story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Um, it has a conflict, you know, um, and, and you resolve the conflict at the end of the story, that kind of thing. Uh, and a descriptive piece is just really a description. It's just a description. And many children struggle with this. Um, and I guess adults would do as well if, if they had cause to write a descriptive piece. Uh, and I'll show you how I hope how simple it is to write a descriptive piece. Now, the way not to begin this. So remember, we're on a beach resting against the side of a rowing boat and we need to describe what we experience. That's all we need to do is we need to describe what we experience. So we need to think visually. So we need to picture ourselves on a beach. We know we've got the beach and we know we've got the rowing boat. So our mind needs to kind of um, connect things to the beach and to the rowing boat. So we think, well, what else do we get on beaches? So we've got, we've got the beach. What connects to the beach? Can anyone tell me what you get that's connected to a beach? Now I've got some more definitions of descriptive writing popping up. So uh, it's a form of writing where it describes a scene or an object. That's absolutely right. Yes. Seas. Yes, exactly. So our, our minds need to kind of expand beyond the, the initial description somewhat. So, yeah, we would see a sea. There's a pretty strong clue that we'd see a sea in the fact that we've got a boat on the beach and we've got a, we've got a beach. There might be a cliff. Uh, there might be seagulls. We've all been to beaches. I think we have. Uh, so we know what kind of things there are to see, but not only what do we see? We see beaches, cliffs and whatnot. We hear things. We hear sounds. So what sounds do we hear? What sounds do we hear at the beach? People, uh, yes, yes. So you, you said you see shells and pebbles and uh, promenades and seaweed and fish. These are all fantastic things. These are all visual things. So and that's quite interesting because we tend to think visually at first when doing descriptive writing but we shouldn't ignore the other senses so so sound sound is another big one uh, because we we like our information um visual and auditory when we watch films for instance all we're getting are the visuals and the, and the sound um except for some unusual experiments in cinema i think there was a, a cinema in japan going back 20 years now, which try to incorporate smell into the cinematic experience. And I'm guessing it didn't work seeing as it hasn't taken off globally. You can't go into your into your local cinema and have kind of smells kind of pumped into the into the theater as you're watching your your film. People don't want that. But we, we need to think in terms of sound as well. Yes, someone said the wind's howling, the laughter of children screeching. Yes, lapping waves, waves crashing against the rocks, the splashing. Someone said salty, briny tang of the sea. That's really good because that is taste information, the tangy brine of the sea, the briny, the briny sea. Brilliant. Well done. The person who said that, that's fantastic. So, and we can think about smell as well. So, what does the sea smell like? Well, it's what does the sea, before I say, what does the sea smell like to you? What what bouquets does the sea have? Waiting for the chat. While I'm waiting for the chat, I'll just say that this exercise that we're doing now, this is, has yielded enough information for us to write a descriptive piece already um we've got the words salt so yeah you can smell the salt um we've got brackish we've got salty um we've got more salty so so <laughs> definitely salty um definitely salty the sea is also a bit pongy isn't it if we're honest we all like going to the beach we all like going to the beach but it does pong a bit and that's not just because thames water has been pumping all the sewage into it um it it, it pongs a bit because of the the life forms in the sea. They, they give off a kind of sulfuric tang. So what you've kind of thrown at me in the chat, that's enough for us to build uh, you know, a very successful piece of descriptive writing around that would do well 
in the exam. Now, how we're not going to start this, we're not going to start by saying, I was washed up on this beach six days ago. And the reason being is that's beginning to get us into narrative territory. We're beginning to tell a story already, which we want to avoid because we're not writing a story. So how do we begin this or, or how do we write any of this without writing any narrative? The best way I can recommend we do that is just by thinking we need to be in the moment. Yeah, it's about what we are experiencing in this very moment. So you imagine yourself at the beach in a moment of time. What do you experience in that moment of time? OK, and it doesn't need to be like you're stuck in one moment, but there'll be a moment after that and a moment after that and a moment after that. So long as you're always in those moments and you don't go into the past um, to try and work out how you got here and this, that and the other, you should be fine. So remember, stay in the moment or moments plural. Someone has asked, what about sand in the water? And the same person asked, how you have been washed up in the first person? Yes, don't talk about how you've been. Yes, well, um, don't, just don't talk about how you've been washed up. Um, don't introduce more than one character. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. I guess there could be times when, yeah, there might be another person in the scene in the descriptive piece. So you might have to maybe acknowledge them, but generally be on safe grounds and just don't introduce anyone else as a as a kind of interlocutor or, or actor in your writing. So you've all got some pretty good ideas about what descriptive writing is and isn't. So how should we begin this? Well, I would suggest because I've got to change my script a bit because I don't have the picture with me, but I would suggest that because we are, I am, I the narrator am resting against the side of a rowing boat. I'm going to begin with that. So I'm going to think, okay, if I was on the beach sitting down, imagine this, you're, you're on the beach, you're sitting down, and your back is supported by the side of a rowing boat. What initially is your experience going to be? What are you going to sense? Most important thing about descriptive writing is the sense, the sensory information. What? So someone's given a very poetic opening. The wooden oak boat lay in the golden sand drenched by the salty water. I love that. That's good. That's good. You are on the way to writing a very good piece of descriptive writing. Um, so this is how I began. So I prepared this earlier um, so I didn't get flustered by, by having to be creative live because I'm, I'm not very good at being creative under pressure. Um, so the way I began was this opening. You should see it on the screen in five, four, three, two, one seconds. Oh, there's a bit of a lag here. A lag of about 10 seconds. OK. But the way I begin is by saying the weight of the rowing boat presses against my spine. Some dampness transfers from its wooden planks to the back, back of my dress. And, and by the way, uh, the reason why I'm writing as a female is because in the original picture, it was a woman who was resting against the boat. Um, so, um, yes, that's that's why the narrator's wearing a dress. So what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm thinking about the brief and I'm getting right to the point, right to the brief. And that is I have a boat pressing against, I'm, I'm resting against the boat. So I need to think about how the boat feels. Um, so if you imagine that, so the boat is going to be curved because boats are curved. They're, they're not kind of cuboid, they're curved and kind of curve into a point, don't they? Um, and how would that feel? How would that feel? Well, I can't say the weight of the rowing boat presses against my spine. So it's kind of like a pressure, but it's not an uncomfortable pressure. But more than that, I'm thinking, well, would the boat be dry or would it be damp? I think the answer to that question is, is pretty obvious because we are right by at sea and the sea has a tide. So even if the tide is not in right at this very moment of time, it would have been in at some point 
presumably, um, and made the boat damp. And the sea environment is generally very damp, so it's going to stay damp. So if I'm leaning against the boat, some of that dampness, I'm going to experience that, aren't I? So I thought, well, how am I going to experience that? Well, how about my my the back of my dress absorbs some of the dampness? Okay. Are you with me so far? Oh, so uh, some of you have said that the, the boat would feel uneven or rough. Yes, that, that's brilliant. So if you were doing this yourselves, you could introduce the roughness of the boat or the unevenness of it. Uh, and if you want to point out the unevenness of the boat, then you could you could make the boat feel more uncomfortable than I have. Um, yes, or rough, you know, describe the roughness against the, you know, against your back. Absolutely good stuff. So here's the important point about descriptive writing. We've done the first thing right, which is we've talked about sensory information. And that's all you're going to do all the way through is talk about sensory information. The, the part of this that often gets left out is you need to respond, or rather, the narrator needs to respond to the sensory information. And that's really important. Who can tell me why it's important that you have your narrator respond to the sensory information or the, the sensory experience that they're having? And while you're thinking about that, I'll read out some other comments. There's, there's some lovely writing here. Above the mahogany vessel, Sounds expensive, mahogany for a boat. Maybe boats are mahogany, I, I don't know. Um, above the mahogany vessel, the sun's rays were smothered by the clouds, rendering me dismal. Mmm, I like it. And someone said barnacles. Absolutely, but barnacles, barnacles on the boat. Yeah, I didn't think of that. That's a really good detail. And descriptive writing is all about the detail. So you need to, I, I hate the term gran granular. You need to be as precise as you can when you're imagining your scenes. So it's all very easy to imagine, I'm on a beach, sun, sea, sand, done. But you need to really get down to the detail. So, you know, if you're thinking, well, well, what do I see at the finer level? I might see barnacles stuck to the side of a boat. Uh, I might see crabs in a rock pool. Um, you might notice how the in the, not the individual grains, but you might notice how the the grains of sand feel. Are they are they rough? Are they smooth? You need to really get into the detail. Um, you know, what shade of sea is is the water? Is it is it more grey? Is it more blue? What kind of shade of grey or blue? Um, okay, no one's answered my question yet. So the the next thing that you need to do is this: you need to react to the sensory experience because in real life you have sensory experiences and and sometimes you react to them and that's very important if you don't react to the sensory experiences all you're going to be doing is making a list of sensory experiences uh, there needs to be some action here and the 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 action is brought by and by action i don't mean kind of like shooting machine guns and driving fast cars and everything not that kind of action i mean by action doing things. The reason why we read anything is because we want to to read about people doing things. Uh, so we need we need our narrator to do things here, uh, not just have things done to them, not just to experience things. So I would proceed with this sentence, which I'm going to paste in now. And you should see the next sentence very soon. I'm going to read it while you're waiting for it to appear on the screen. So, I shift forward, dragging the shingle beneath me. They dully rattle together. The pressure is relieved, but in the space created between me and the boat, the damp patch on my dress conducts the sea wind to it, and I shiver. So, here we have reaction number one, I shift forward. So, Presumably, I'm shifting forward because I don't like the feeling of dampness on my dress. So I'm going to move away from the boat for that reason. So I have reacted to the sensory experience. Good. So what happens when I move forward? I need to think about that now. So I'm sitting on the beach. So as I move forward, 
you know my my posterior is will we'll probably move some sand or shingle beneath me so I, i've got some shingle here so sh so shingle a, a little stone so it's a kind of beach formed of little stones and if i shift forward the stones are going to to move aren't they because i've moved so i've said i shift forward dragging the shingle beneath me well okay the shingle has acted or been acted upon it's been moved so what happens what sensory experience is created when the shingle moves so i thought well they might make a sound so i thought well what sound will they make these stones and i thought they, it won't be a very musical sound because stones aren't musical mm -hmm. some things make a very musical sound stones don't they they're, they're the opposite to musical in some way they're, they're kind of percussive but not very interesting percussion so i wrote they dully rattle together. Now you'll notice that I've used the adverb dully to modify the verb rattle. Now, in my creative writing tuition, what I advise students to do is not to overuse adverbs or adjectives. Um, and I've used one here. So why have I used an adverb? Well, I would say use an adverb when you can't get a verb to do the job for you what do i mean by that okay let's say i have someone who is going for a job interview maybe that's not the best example for kids but okay when you're an adult you'll go for a job and you'll have to do an interview maybe some of you will have to interviews for the schools that you're applying to let's just go with this so let's say I want to say that I walked into the room confidently. I walked into the interview room confidently. So I say, I walked into the room confidently. Just that. So the problem here is there are verbs that could do the work that the adverb confidently is doing. I could say, I strode into the room. Yeah, striding, big long footsteps. You do that when you're feeling confident. So I could say, I strode into the room. And you can infer from the verb and the action that I'm taking, how I'm feeling, okay? Um, so it's unnecessary to use, to tell, to tell the reader the way in which you're performing the action confidently. But here, maybe it's my failure as a creative writer, but I couldn't think of a verb that could convey the sound of so stones knocking together. So I put the adverb dully in there to help me convey that sound. So when it comes to adverbs, it's often about context. You know, sometimes it's right to use them and sometimes it's less right to use them. You just need to develop a sense of knowing when to use them and when not to use them. I hope that's clear. Someone said the shingle were like castanets. That's that's good. That's good. Maybe maybe the shingle on a Spanish beach, especially like castanets. I like that. Good good literary device. Good simile. Um, OK, so. And then I said the pressure is relieved. Well, why have I said that? Because I was up against the boat or rather the boat was up against me and I've moved away from the boat. So I need to acknowledge the new sensory experience because the sensory experience has changed from one of there being a boat at my back to one of there not being a boat at my back. So we need to acknowledge that. So the pressure is relieved. I no longer have the feeling of a boat at my back. But in the space created between me and the boat, the damp patch on my dress conducts the sea wind to it. So again, I thought, now that I've moved away from the back from the boat, and now that I've freed myself from the the source of the dampness, then what happens now? What happens now? Because now there's nothing between my dress and the boat. My dress is damp. What's going to happen? And I thought, well, whenever my clothes are damp, I can really, really feel when it's a cold day. The cold air just, just kind of goes to it, you know, just like a like a magnet in some 
in some way that the cold just go if, if something is cold and damp the cold goes to it even more it makes it worse it exacerb exacerbates the problem so i thought okay okay yeah in the space between me and the boat the damp patch on my dress conducts a sea wind to it and i shiver so i shiver so i have responded again to the sensory experience i shiver so no more comments so what have we got so far we have got a bit of visual information um well actually we've got more more kind of um tactile information tactile means touch so we started by talking about um the pressure of the rowing boat and the dampness so that, that's actually tactile information we've got touch there already um and we've got sound we've got a sound experience there we experience the sound of the uh stones the shingle knocking together um, we've got the pressure relieving uh, and we've got the feeling of the sea wind going to the damp patch on the back of our dress so actually it's not visual information that we have first and foremost it it's um tactile information and sound information so we've, we've kind of covered two of the senses already so let's write some more and see where we go i'm going to paste in the next bit of this writing and you should see it soon and i'll read it while we're waiting for it to appear so i pinch at my dress and i peel it momentarily from my back and in the space between skin and fabric, a dry air barrier forms against the dampness and sea wind. My skin smooths with that little bit of warmth. Right, and you can see that now. So again, we've got a physical action. So I'm pinching at my dress and peeling it momentarily from my back. So do you know when your clothes are a bit damp, you might you might kind of tug at it just to, you know somehow kind of encourage the, the dampness away or maybe if you're hot you'll do that to encourage the heat away and create a bit of a breeze but but you know we do that to our clothes when when we're in some way uncomfortable um so i've had the narrator kind of pinch at her dress and peel it momentarily from her back to kind of free herself from that kind of clammy damp sensation which is not pleasant and you will notice i've used an adverb again momentarily and I thought, well, I've got an adverb. Is it justified? I, I think when we use adverbs or even adjectives, we must ask ourselves, is the adverb or is the adjective justified here? And I justify it in this way, because if I didn't say momentarily and I just said, I peel the dress from my back, well, that's going to make it sound like the, the narrator's undressing, which she's not, do which she's not doing. Um, so we just want to make it clear that she's kind of momentarily just peeling it uh, the dress from her back okay um so the 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 adverb momentarily really does serve a purpose there so does it serve a purpose very important question okay so we need to think now we've kind of peeled momentarily the, the fabric away from from our back what sensation are we going to get because if i haven't belabored the point already the sensation is incredibly important so this is the sensation in the space between skin and fabric a dry air barrier forms against the dampness and the sea wind so we kind of got some dry air going in there now to protect us from the the dampness and the sea wind um and you will notice here i have doo -doo 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 -doo. use sea wind twice i seem to think yes once without a hyphen and once with a hyphen so we don't want to do that in our exams we don't want to look inconsistent or indeed indecisive or worse that we don't know what we're doing so consistency is a, is a good thing when it comes to spelling um, right uh, and okay so my skin smooths with that little bit of warmth so i'm really thinking about the detail here so i'm thinking if your skin warms up a bit how do you react to that well you, you if you're goose bumped um, you might become de bumped if that makes sense. Your, your skin might smooth, okay, because it, it kind of ridges when it's cold and uncomfortable. But but once you get a bit of warmth, those, those goosebumps will, will kind of smooth out. 
And that's what I've tried to communicate here. Okay, so let's move on to the next paragraph. I'm going to read it while we're waiting for the first sentence of the next paragraph to, to appear. So we have a wave frayed into foam at the edge of the sea tickles my feet, washing away some sand lodged between my toes. So I was thinking here, we need to make use of, of the sea because we're on the beach. We can't ignore it. So how are we going to make use of the sea? Well, I thought about waves. Well, what do waves look like when they come in from the sea? Well, the sea kind of thins out, doesn't it? As it reaches the shore, it becomes thin. And I thought, well, what's a good way of kind of conveying its thinness? So I use the metaphor of the, the, the waves of frayed. Okay, so, so fraying is what happens to your clothing at the edges. Maybe you've got an old shirt or something or an old t-shirt. The, the ends of the t-shirt, the threads will come loose. That's fraying. So I use this metaphor of fraying. Okay, it's a very subtle metaphor. And that's an important thing to say as well is that you don't need to go all out with your literary devices. You don't need to kind of bombard the examiner with literary device after literary device after literary device and make them really obvious. Nothing wrong with a subtle literary device. We've got a subtle one here. So the wave frayed into foam at the edges of the sea, because when when the sea comes into the shore, it becomes not only thin, but foamy. So I try to communicate the thinness and foaminess of it. Um, and then it encroaches upon the narrator's feet. Well, we need to ask ourselves, how does it feel? Because this is all about sensation. How does it feel when the foam comes in and touches your feet? It might be, might be a bit ticklish. So I've gone with it tickles my feet. Okay. And then I thought, well, after it's tickled my feet, or as it's tickling my feet, what, what, what is it actually doing? Um, well, or what might it do? Well, what, what it might do is wash away some sand lodged between my toes, because when you're on the beach, uh, and you're walking barefooted, you get sand on your feet and in between your toes. And sand in between your toes, well, I don't like it. It's not a nice sensation for me. So it might wash away some of that sand lodged between your toes. Okay. So then what? Then what? Let's let's continue this thought, shall we? Um, so one thing you want to avoid when you're doing descriptive writing is you want to avoid listiness. You don't want to write a shopping list of things. And I've seen this quite a lot in kids' creative writing. They just write one thing, then another thing, then another thing, then another thing. Um, and it ends up being like a list. And actually, this, this is a, a writerly sin that I used to commit when I wrote poetry. Um, and uh, a, a poet looked at my poetry and he said, I have a habit of uh, writing in a very listy way. It's like one sentence I'll say one thing, next sentence I'll say another thing, sentence after that, or line after that I'll say another thing, line after that I'll say another thing. And his advice to me was continue the thought. Okay, you don't need to, the thought doesn't need to end at the end of the line or the end of the sentence, continue the thought. And, and that's probably some of the best advice I've, I've ever got. So my question to you is how do we continue the thought or how would you continue this thought or how would you continue this experience? How would you linger on it? Well, this is how I did it. So I've decided to react again to the sensory experience of the waves kind of tickling my toes. So I said, I wiggle my toes to free them of more sand. At first they scrape with that grainy friction until near smooth and the sea wind no longer obstructed by the sand finds my toes freshens them. So here we have more kind of tactile, more touch information. We've got the, the kind of grainy feeling that you get when sand is between your toes. We've, we've got ourselves wiggling our toes to get to dislodge, you know, as much of that graininess as, as we can until they're nearly smooth. Okay. And what happens when 
you you kind of dislodge the sand from your toes. I was thinking about this. How do I continue this? How do I continue? Ask yourself the question, what happens now that I've dislodged the sand from my toes? Would there be a new sensory experience? Would you sense something new? And I'm thinking, well, yes, I would, because the 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 kind of if my toes were caked in sand, that sand is acting like a barrier. Again, it's stopping the elements from getting to my toes. So I thought once I've kind of shook off that grain, then, then the elements are free to get to my toes again. So I've had the sea wind again intruding upon my experience. So the sea wind um, freshens my toes. It, it's, it's bringing freshness to my toes. I think that would happen, wouldn't it? Because your toes have been caked up in, in the sand. They wouldn't have as much, they wouldn't be breathing as much, would they? Because your skin needs to breathe. And now we've got rid of it. Our skin can breathe again. It can really feel that fresh, that fresh sea wind on it. Where should we take this next? We've got one more, one more para. I'm just going to plant it in here. Here we go. And I said, another wave blinks in, tantalizing, but not this time reaching my toes. That wave sorts the air a little against the sulfuric ebb. So I was thinking in the next para, paragraph, what I need is some olfactory some smell information because we want to make this as all-encompassing of the senses as we can so i began by saying another wave, another wave flinks in tantalizing but not this time reaching my toes that wave sorts the air a little against the sulfuric ebb before i come to the smell information i just want to talk about flinks now flinks is what literary device is it, first of all? What literary device am I using when I say flinks? Anyone? Is it a metaphor? Is it a simile? Is it hyperbole? Is it onomatopoeia? Is it alliteration? Is it a conceit? Is it allegory? Is it... I've run out of literary devices. It's one of those. Someone said metaphor. It is onomatopoeia. Um, it's a word which is written to approximate the sound it makes. And I borrowed this word from William Golding um, from Lord of the Flies, which is one of my favorite books. Um, it's my favorite children's book, and it's one of my favorite books. Um, and, and William Golding invented the word flinks um, to convey the, the kind of light, foamy sound that waves make when they kind of hit the rocks and I, I borrowed it um so so not the most original thing I've, I've ever done but I think it serves a purpose I, th I, I love the sound flinks flinks it's so original that I think this piece of onomatopoeia needs to be known more um but let's talk about the olfactory information now the smell information so we said the wave sorts the air a little against the sulfuric ebb so I've got the salt coming in um, and it's kind of competing with the sulfur. Okay, so so sulfur is stinky stuff. Okay, sulfur stinks. Uh, and, and the seaside does have a sulfuric kind of smell. I believe it's created by the seaweed. I could be wrong about that. It's created by some life form in the sea. But yeah, the sea, the sea is a bit pongy. Um, so the, the two dominating smells as i see it when you're at the seaside is the saltiness and the sulfur so i thought well how can i talk about this so i said the wave sorts the air a little against the sulfuric ebb um the, the ebb is when the tide goes outwards so we've got the tide going outwards and as the tide goes outwards the kind of sulfuric smell is increasing because you know the the, the life forms the seaweed that creates the sulfuric smell is getting exposure um so there's like a competition between the, the kind of retreating saltiness of the waves and the encroaching sulfur of 
whatever generates the sulfur that is exposed when the tide ebbs away. So we've got our smell information there. So I think we have, we definitely have um, tactile touch information. We've got sound information. Um, we've got, um, doo -doo 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 -doo, we've got smell information. And we, what we don't have here, uh, and unless you're asked specifically to include all the senses, it might not be absolutely necessary, uh, but it's always good to try to. What I don't have here is is any visual information as such. Uh, and, and I definitely don't have taste information. So if I were to continue this, and I think it needs to be continued, um, and, and there I did continue writing this, but I wasn't happy with what I wrote, so I, I kind of removed it. So I want to give you an example of, of optimal writing. Um, if I were to continue this, I would include, I think, well, I need to include some more visual information um, because vision is, is is very important, as we discussed earlier. I mean, it's one of the two um, essential things when you go to a cinema or watch um, something on a TV or on your iPad. It's the sound of the visual information. So you, you can't really get by that well without sound or visual information. Anyway, um, so I would include um, some taste information. So so let's do that now. Let's do that now. I, I won't write on the screen because otherwise my hands will be in front of the camera and it'll be like two huge tarantulas dancing in front of on the keyboard, um, which is not a good look. But um, I want to ask you now to type in the chat, what visual information would you include and what taste information would you include? And I think the taste one might be quite easy. Yes, yes. So so someone has said they would taste a salty brine. That That is what I was thinking. So were we to continue this, I will probably reference the saltiness because you've been to the beach and you, you tend to end up with a kind of salty crust on your lips, don't you? Somehow, especially if you've been into the sea, um, you, you kind of carry some salt deposits on you. At least I find I do. And also the sand is quite salty as well. Um, so you might get some sand on your lip and, you know, just happen to, you know, um, run your tongue over it or whatever. And you, you kind of get that saltiness, that salty, salty sensation. Uh, muddy sea. Someone said muddy sea. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's good visual information. So you could go on to describe the murkiness, the muddiness of the sea. Um, so how let's think about how we talk about that. Well, muddiness is essentially you see the sediment kind of floating around in the sea, don't you? And it kind of turns the otherwise blue sea uh, a bit more brown. You can see that the sediments of the mud kind of spinning around. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's really really good visual information. I like that. Um, someone said the luminous, lustrous, sun illuminated light like a lamp. However, the cotton white pillows showed some mercy. Wow, that is that is literary device overdrive. That is well, wow. The luminous, lustrous, sun illuminated light like a lamp. La, 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 la. Lots of lots of L's there. Um, okay, so so one bit of advice I'd give you is try not to. It's very good what you wrote, but try not to overwrite. The thing is that luminous, lustrous, and illuminated all have the same root in Latin. Okay, so the L U is a is a bit of a giveaway. The the lu, the illumination, the luminous, the lustrous. Um, all have something to do with light so so in a way you're kind of repeating the same quality three times i, I know kind of lustrous mean, means shiny um but nonetheless um nonetheless so, so you might like to go with one of those things but not all three things so you you, you might like to say um the sun um illuminated the scene like a lamp that that will be perfectly cooked it's not undercooked it's not overcooked 
Um, so imagine when you're doing creative writing, imagine that you're a chef. What you don't want to do is throw too many ingredients into your into the mix because that will end up with a kind of clash of tastes and cooking styles and uh, and might not quite work. So so as with your ingredients when you're cooking, if you cook kids, maybe you don't cook. I've started getting my kids to cook, actually. So maybe maybe you do. Um, don't don't overdo it is what I'm saying. Um, so we also have the solemn waves grasped timidly at the shoreline. Good. That's a lovely, that's a lovely, lovely visual um, kind of image. Um, so, so yes, I've actually, before I get onto that, I've realized I do have visual information there. So I've, I've got this image of the wave fraying into foam at the edge of the sea. So, so I've kind of covered myself with the visual information. It's just the, the taste information I lack. But going back to what you say, um, one of my, my listeners um, has said, the solemn wave grass timidly at the shoreline. That's brilliant. That is fantastic. That's better than what I wrote. That's better than what I wrote. Um, that's personification because the sea doesn't literally grasp. Um, that's only something um, animals can do because you need a hand or a claw to grasp. Um, and grasp timidly. Okay, that, that's an interesting phrase, grasp timidly at the shoreline. I like that a lot. I like that a lot. That's really original. Um, and then we've got elevated cliffs overhung the cove. Its arcane mysteries concealed by massive rock and boulders. I'm getting very poetic there. Very poetic. The fine mess of the trees in the unscrutinized part of the beach. Unscrutinized. Big word. Uh, and someone else says candy floss cows floated lazily across the clear blue sky. I wonder what it is about candy floss and clouds. Well, I, I know what it is that they share a property which which makes them ripe for metaphorical comparison. Uh, and I remember when I was a kid and I wanted to be a pop star. <laughs> uh, when I was 18, I, um, I, I did write about candy floss clouds myself. So oh dear, that was a bad song. Um, what you wrote was good. What I wrote when I was 18 was, was bad. Um, okay, so uh, we got the emerald jewel of coral reefs and diamond dust beaches were enclosed in an ochre light shot by the grinning sun. Wow. Wow. I'm going to read that again. Let that one sink in. The emerald jewel of coral reefs and diamond dust beaches were enclosed by an ochre light shot by the grinning sun. Okay, so as with the other person to whom I commented, try not to overwrite. This is this is a fantastic example of overwriting. The problem of overwriting is sometimes you end up with a bit of a logical mess. So I really, really, what you're showing is an ability to write poetically. So you have a poetic mind. And that's a really, really good start because not everyone can write that. Not everyone can write um with these kind of rich images with this kind of metaphorical language um so so what you want to do is avoid making a mess when you're overwriting okay so i would say that the emerald jewel of coral reefs so emerald is green are coral reefs green they might be green in part and i'm not a big aficionado on coral reefs but as i understand they're quite um rich in color so and and coral you know if you buy a piece of coral jewelry or something that purports to be coral jewelry you'll see it's a, a kind of very pastel pink color um so yeah coral reefs include a lot of color but the color we commonly associate with coral itself is not it's not emerald green it's 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 coral pink um and we've got diamond dust beaches okay i kind of like that kind of see where you're going there so if you kind of got a diamond and you maybe you drilled into it you get a load of diamond dust wouldn't you actually it's quite funny because you see these bands going around don't you and it says they say diamond drilling on them and i, I, I didn't know what that meant and i thought well, diamond drilling does that mean 
they drill into diamonds, or does that mean they use diamond to drill? And I think it means they use diamond to drill because um, because diamond is very precise. Okay, if, if it were used as a drill bit, tip of a drill, it'd be very precise. But anyway, I'm digressing again. Yes, um, if you kind of could grind diamond to a really fine powder, a kind of white sand beach would, would look very much like diamond dust. Okay, I get you there. I understand you there. Um, enclosed by an ochre light shot by the grinning sun. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. You want to personify the sun as a grinner. Okay. Okay. Um, we have the towering myriad of trees blocked the unbearable sunlight. Interesting. So, so presumably, backing onto the beach, we we have a, a canopy of trees. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, you do get that. You you do get. It. Um, I like that. I like that. Good words in there. Myriad. If you if you're a child, I'm impressed by myriad. Um, okay, we have the infuriated water personification again. The infuriated water energetically rammed against the screaming shoreline. So I'd say to you, um, author of this line, you could just drop the adverb. I'm not sure energetically does a job here you could just say the infuriated water rammed against the screaming shoreline and if you get rid of the energetically you're emphasizing the action of ramming more so um which complements well the infuriation of the sea it just makes everything sound a bit more angry so try and avoid adverbs when they have a diluting effect and i think your adverb there has a diluting effect on an otherwise very powerful angry line um right the porcelain sand I like that. That's a very, um, that, that's a conceit, isn't it, in a way. It's um, kind of like a far-fetched metaphor, the porcelain sand, scintillated. It's a big word. Where do you kids all get these words from? Scintillated in the radiant sun. It's benevolent rays bathing me in a blanket of perpetual warmth. That's nice, that is. That's nice. I like that. So we've got one very angry one <laughs> from from one commenter. Um, who says the infuriated water rammed against the screaming shoreline. We've got a very peaceful one. The porcelain sand scintillated in the radi radiant sun. It's benevolent rays bathing me in a blanket of perpetual warmth. That's good. Okay, so we've got some really, really nice stuff from you. We're at the hour mark. I was having so much fun. I was having so much fun. I could have gone on for another hour, but we will leave it there. Um, I would say here what you're seeing is nine-tenths of a really good um, piece of descriptive writing. I will probably need to add a couple more lines to make it perfect. Um, but if you wrote this in an exam or something similar to this, you'll be really fine. What I want you to take home from this, you're already at home. What I want you to take away from this lesson is that the most important thing about descriptive writing is one, don't write a story. Two, write about sensory um, details. Yeah, that's the most important thing. You're, you're writing about your sensory experiences and you have five senses. And three, you need to react to a lot of those sensory experiences. Um, and that's a virtue in itself because what happens is, okay, this is what happens. It's like a chain. It's like a gift that keeps giving. You describe a sensory experience. You react to that sensory experience. That reaction creates a new, new sensory experience. And that sensory experience requires your reaction, which creates a new sensory experience and so forth and so on. So you kind of get this chain that should make if you follow it should make your your writing um easier to produce um so we're going to leave it there um i hope you found that useful i'm just going to remind you of, of who i am and and also um to, to thank the 11 plus journey again so so i'm james from 11 plus prep school we do online small group tuition um at 11 plus prep school.co.uk um if you want to ask me a question or talk to me it's you can on whatsapp um on 07736252419. Now we are running summer courses very, very soon where we're going to have a little intensive session or sessions, plural. Um, so we've got four math sessions, four reasoning sessions and four English sessions. And what we're going to do is we're going to give you a really, really concentrated education. Okay, so we're kind of going to drill into you everything that we think that you need to know or as much as we can drill into you 
ahead of the exam and make sure that you know what you need to know before you go into the exam. I'll give you for a for instance. Um, so if we take my English course, um, part of it is SPAG, spelling and grammar proofreading. What I would do is I would make sure that you understand the finite, the limited number of types of punctuation error that you can be tested on. And I will make sure that you understand and remember every single type of punctuation error that could conceivably be tested on or as, or as best I know. So that when you go into the, your exam and if you get a proofreading uh, exam, you have to proofread punctuation, you will be very, very confident about the types of punctuation error that you could be tested on. That's just an example. But anyway, um, check out our boot camps. Sign up for them. And finally, to say thanks once again to uh, Saba and to the 11 plus journey um, with, for hosting this uh, and the 11 plus journey as a community of parents and educators involved in the overall development of children through academic excellence you can visit their website the 11 plus journey.co.uk for more resources and this video lesson will be available on the 11 plus journey youtube channel shortly hereafter Thank you, everyone. I hope you found it useful. It's been wonderful to have you here. Thanks for listening to me. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.